And the other thing that I don't think Washington is very good at is sort of thinking about, okay, no one cares whether the securities laws apply or no, no one outside of Washington cares. What they care about is, are we making the world a better place by applying regulation? Or are we just making things complicated and not serving anyone's interests? Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. This is how to get started, how to get better, how to front run the opportunity. This is Ryan Sean Adams. I'm here with David Hoffman, and we're here to help you become more bankless. Today, we have Hester Peirce, SEC Commissioner, on the episode as we're three months into 2023, which seems to be the worst regulatory environment we've ever seen in the United States. And she comes on to drop some insight. Hester, of course, is often known to dissent from her colleagues, other SEC commissioners on crypto-related actions. And we talk about that today. A few things to look out for. Number one, we talk about what crypto could be if we had a first principles SEC. Number two, we talk about the definition of a security. What is a security? Can we define it yet? Number three, we hear Hester flat out say that the SEC is trying to increase its jurisdictional reach. Surprising. Number four, how do we move forward with the SEC? That is a question on all of our minds. And number five, how can crypto take its share of the responsibility to move things forward with our regulators? David, so much covered in this episode. What should folks pay attention to? I think Hester really offers us an archetype of a good regulator to actually latch on to. Uh, and so the, the SEC is on a monolith. There's five different commissioners there. Uh, and so while everyone kind of considers the SEC to be Gary Gensler, there are other commissioners in there who disagree with the overall direction of the SEC. And Hester Peirce is one of them. And so Hester Peirce offers us a perspective of what the SEC could be if it had aligned and first principles regulators. And so that's one of the first perspectives that I think uh, bankless listeners will be able to walk away with. I think the other big one is is that gone are the days of us being able to just like, oh, is the SEC really just trying to increase its scope and increase its power and authority? It's like, yes, is like uh, the an it's SEC not a conspiracy theory. is not a conspiracy <laughs> anymore. Like this is just now flat out stated. And so now that that is what is just known now we have to account for that. And how do we move forward when the, the, you know, the mask has been ripped off? Uh, so these are, I think, the two big things that people can walk away with uh, from this episode. And just like, now that the, the, the game is a little bit up, how do we proceed? How do we keep on moving? Yeah, uh, the masks are off, certainly, yeah. as we get into this episode. We know where people stand. Uh, David, there's so much more I want to talk to you yeah. about in the debrief. Uh, this is just a fantastic conversation. And I, I want to discuss what this means. Of course, Bankless Nation, the debrief is our episode that we record right after the episode that has our thoughts on this episode with Hester Purse. And you can upgrade your membership to mm -hmm. Bankless Citizenship and mm -hmm. access the debrief episode now at a brand new website, bankless.com. Yep, we got the dot com. dot com. Go ahead and do that. There is a link in the show notes where you can get that done and access the debrief. Guys, we're going to get right to our episode with Commissioner Purse. But before we do, we want to thank the sponsors that made this episode possible, including Kraken, our number one recommended crypto exchange for 2023. Kraken has been a leader in the crypto industry for the last 12 years. Dedicated to accelerating the global adoption of crypto, Kraken puts an emphasis on security, transparency, and client support, which is why over 9 million clients have come to love Kraken's products. Whether you're a beginner or a pro, the Kraken UX is simple, intuitive, and frictionless, making the Kraken app a great place for all to get involved and learn about crypto. For those with experience, the redesigned Kraken Pro app and web experience is completely customizable to your trading needs, integrating key key trading features into one seamless interface. Kraken has a 24-7, 365 client support team that is globally recognized. Kraken support is available wherever, whenever you need them, by phone, chat, or email. And for all of you NFTers out there, the brand new Kraken NFT beta platform gives you the best NFT trading experience possible. Rarity rankings, no gas fees, and the ability to buy an NFT straight with cash. Does your crypto exchange prioritize its customers the way that Kraken does? And if not, sign up with Kraken at Kraken com slash bankless. How many total airdrops have you gotten? This last bull market had a ton of them. Did you get them all? Maybe you missed one. So here's what you should do. Go to Earnify and plug in your Ethereum wallet and Earnify will tell you if you have any unclaimed airdrops that you can get. And it also does PO apps and mintable NFTs. Any kind of money that your wallet can claim, Earnify will tell you about it. 
and you should probably do it now because some airdrops expire. And if you sign up for Earnify, they'll email you anytime one of your wallets has a new airdrop for it to make sure that you never lose an airdrop ever again. You can also upgrade to Earnify Premium to unlock access to airdrops that are beyond the basics and are able to set reminders for more wallets. And for just under $21 a month, it probably pays for itself with just one airdrop. So plug in your wallets at Earnify and see what you get. That's E-A-R-N-I dot F-I. And make sure you never lose another airdrop. Learning about crypto is hard, until now. Introducing MetaMask Learn, an open educational platform about crypto, Web3, self-custody, wallet management, and all the other topics needed to onboard people into this crazy world of crypto. MetaMask Learn is an interactive platform with each lesson offering a simulation for the task at hand, giving you actual practical experience for navigating Web3. The purpose of MetaMask Learn is to teach people the basics of self-custody and wallet security in a safe environment. And while MetaMask Learn always takes the time to define Web3 specific vocabulary, it is still a jargon-free experience for the crypto curious user. Friendly, not scary. MetaMask Learn is available in 10 languages with more to be added soon, and it's meant to cater to a global Web3 audience. So are you tired of having to explain crypto concepts to your friends? Go to learn.metamask.io and add MetaMask Learn to your guides to get onboarded into the world of Web3. Bankless Nation, very excited to introduce our next guest to you. Hester Purse is one of five SEC commissioner. So one of five. She's been a commissioner ever since 2018. Her term is ending in 2025. I definitely wish it was longer here, David. But uh, Mm -hmm. Hester is also a previous podcast guest on Bankless. She consistently makes statements about uh, the SEC, how it should regulate capital markets um, from a first principles perspective, which we think is definitely the way to approach this and why we've enjoyed her guidance so much. Hester, the last time you were on Bankless was two years ago. So it was April 12th, 2021. My How Time Flies. How are you doing? And welcome back. Well, thank you, Ryan. And thanks, David, um, for having me. I'm going to start with my little disclaimer, which you all know, which is that my views are my own views, not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. It's hard to believe that it's been two years. I feel like nothing has been accomplished in that time. Um, <laughs> So yes, I'm a little discouraged, but um, we we have to continue on and try to get some things done. So, um, you know, obviously we've had some bad bad events happen since in those two years also, some very bad events. I think they've been learning experiences for everyone involved, for regulators, as well as for people in the industry. Um, but we also, I think, have had some bad events on the part of regulators, and I'm hoping that that's what we can work on changing. Absolutely. So are we. We're, we're actually optimistic about the future. They say that the best way out is through, and we're sh- certainly going through it now. Um, Hester, we want to cover a number of things today, including kind of first principles of the SEC, just refresh folks on that. What's going well? What could be improved? Um, making the case to crypto natives of what's good about the SEC? What, what should we appreciate from this regulatory body? And also, we'd love some of your feedback on how we in crypto can engage better, how our industry can improve as well. You ready for all that? I am. Before we get in, just a quick touch base. Uh, The U.S. banking system has had some events here recently. Uh, Just curious, because it's top of mind, current event, of course. Does any of that touch the SEC or how how is kind of the um, what you shepherd and have oversight over affected by some of this? I mean, certainly the financial system in the United States is is very connected. And so what happens in the banking system can have ramifications for the markets that we regulate. Um, and, and sometimes the entities that are banking entities have have affiliated entities that we regulate. So there there certainly can be connections. And and sometimes banks are public companies and we regulate disclosures of public companies. So again, there's another potential touch point. But I mean, certainly we're watching closely what's going on. And um, it's, you know, it's it's never it's never good to see those kinds of things happening. Um, and and so we watch to make sure that it, it doesn't have rever- rever- reverberations on the on the entities that we're regulating directly. So Hester, for people that have not watched our first episode uh, with you, which was a great learning lesson for me about just like the first principles reason about why we have the SEC. I'm wondering if we could just return to that conversation, start there, because I, I, I believe you listened to our, my uh, own little rabbit hole investigation of securities, why we have securities laws in the first place. 
Uh, and if from the crypto perspective, it's very easy to say, oh, SEC bad, like regul- regulators bad. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping you could pitch to the Bankless Nation about like why we need an entity like the SEC, what the SEC does. And then after that, we're going to rotate into the conversation of what the SEC can do for crypto uh, in the, if we can all allow this like a uh, future world to, to come about in the way that we hope it does. So, but we'll, we'll start there, like make the case for why we need securities laws and why we need an organization like the SEC. Yeah, so securities laws are there to address something called information asymmetries. That's, that's one of the key purposes, which is if you're, if you're trying to raise money um, to build a company and you have all the information yourself, right? You know what you're trying to build, you know, you know what your background is, but someone buying shares of that company doesn't necessarily know all that. And so the SEC comes in and says, all right, we're gonna help level the playing field. We're gonna make sure that the person raising money is providing sufficient information to the person who is providing the money. And so that can be a very important um, uh, role. It doesn't have to be played by government, but I think that um, the SEC has played that role well over the years. And then we regulate various entities in the markets. We regulate broker dealers, investment advisors, stock exchanges. So again, those infrastructures are so important to the economy, to the functioning of the economy. And so having someone uh, having a regulator looking at what they're doing can be very beneficial um, for the smooth functioning of those entities. So, um, Commissioner Purse, is, is, is part of the you role... You can call me Hester. Please. Thank you, Hester. <laughs> so is, is part of the role here, here to, like, remove information asymmetries or provide transparency to those information asymmetries? So when an information asymmetry is identified where um, some insider group has knowledge that the general market doesn't, maybe in particular the retail market, how does the SEC work to bridge that gap or make that more transparent? Or what actions do you take? Yeah, so if, if it's a public company, the company has to make filings that everyone can see. And those filings talk about whether it's making money or losing money, talk about what their, their risks are, um, the nature of their business, how much their executives are getting compensated. So there's all kinds of information that we require companies to produce. And so that does eliminate um, the, the dis- disparity between what the insiders have and then what investors have. Now, that doesn't mean that we eliminate all information disparities. I mean, different people have different information and they make decisions about whether to buy or sell based on that information. It's only when they're insiders that we want to make sure that they're they're operating on a level playing field. But if you sit down at night and you do a lot of research on a company and you have a lot of information and I don't have that information, you're under no obligation to provide it to me if you're not if you're not uh, somehow affiliated with the company. That's that's kind of generally. I mean, I'm 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 simplifying it a bit, but that's kind of how how we think about things. And there was this big just aha moment, big unlock moment for me when I was really approaching understanding the SEC and securities laws from the concept of centralization and decentralization. Um, decent- in a decentralized system or a decentralized asset like a commodity or assets that are commodity-like, there tends to not be information asymmetries because there's no centralization there. So there's this innate relationship that's, that the SEC has with centralization. It is a check on what is the principal agent problem that naturally comes along with centralized entities and capital markets and capital formation. And so understanding that like in a decentralized world, the the SEC doesn't really care so much about the decentralized world because there's no information asymmetry there. Um, In a centralized world, when someone knows something that the public does not, that's when management of this principal agent problem becomes appropriate. And so Hester, I'm I'm wondering if we can start to apply some of this under... David, I think you put that really eloquently. I like that a lot. I think that's a good a good frame to think about things in. So go ahead. Appreciate it. Yeah, and I'd like to start to apply some of this kind of uh, perspective towards the crypto markets because I, I think there is a big is ought gap in what crypto is today versus what it could be in the future. 
uh, as it relates to good securities regulation and good SEC regulation. So, Hester, I'm wondering if we could just daydream for a moment uh, about a future state of crypto that has good, healthy SEC regulation and a, and a fantastic relationship with the SEC. What can we do in this future state of crypto that I hope eventually arises? Like, what could that become? Sounds so nice when you put it that yeah. way, David. By yeah. the way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're hoping we'll get there. Uh, Well, I mean, I think, first of all, centralized entities, I mean, you can come to different conclusions about whether you think centralized entities in crypto need to have a a federal regulator. A lot of people, I think, especially after the events of last year, are very comfortable and enthusiastic about that idea. And so if we're going to do that, then the SEC is a potential candidate to be the, the regulator of trading platforms, of issuers of tokens, potentially, um, you know, I think we have to think about that. But if you're if you're really talking about a state where crypto has reached its potential and there's a lot of decentralized activity, I think we better be careful now to make sure that we're not just layering on the traditional regulatory system on top of decentralization, because as you pointed out, the the decentralized model really solves a lot of the problems that you would be trying to solve with regulation. Everything is open source, so everyone can see what the terms are that they're engaging on. No one has access to more information than anyone else, and and um, no one is able to shut anyone else's access off. Right? This is every everything is accessible to everyone. And so whatever we do, I think we, we need to carve out the decentralized aspects uh, and really it, it, a different regulatory approach needs to be taken. I would argue a, a, a much different one where a lot of that doesn't need the regulator sitting on top and watching what's going on. My layman's view here, Hester, is that anything with this uh, information asymmetry, right, that, that it, you know, has this market failure... Uh, mode where some insider knows more than, than retail and causes a market inefficiency and causes some unfairness uh, in the market. Anything kind of like that or in that sphere from a first principles perspective, it's sort of um, a security. But I feel like we don't necessarily in crypto have clarity. We have a new set of assets here that are digital assets on which of these assets might be securities and which might not be. And I, I do feel like this is still the case um, you know, two years later, since we first had this conversation, I don't feel like we're any closer to actually getting that clarity. I mean, so um, NFTs, uh, are these collectibles? Or is this something that should be regulated by the security? Does it depend on the type of NFT and, and what it drives? Um, various tokens, like are these securities? Are they not? Does it Does it totally depend? Um, are we any closer to being able to define what a security is? I know often quoted back to, to crypto as well, there's the Howey test, which is some court precedent. We understand that, but it doesn't answer all of the questions here, particularly as we address this new asset class. So do you feel like um, you or the SEC has a good definition on what a security is that it can present to crypto, or is this an area of work? I mean, it's cer- we're certainly not any further along than we were. Um, and look, the definition of security is broad. You mentioned the Howey test that ties to investment contracts, which is one piece of what a secu- one one element of the definition of security is this broad investment contract category. And that's where a lot of the discussion has been around crypto offerings, because what the SEC has said is, look, if you have someone selling a token along with a lot of promises that they're planning to build a network and increase the value of the token because the network is going to be great, then that, uh, the SEC has argued, could fall within the category of an investment contract. And therefore, there needed to be some sort of registration with us or some sort of exemption from registration. The problem is that this is, this is really a, a difficult application because if that invest token was sold as part of an investment contract does the token itself have to register as a security or and and be treated as a security all along so one question is what is a security and the second question is 
Well, if it's a security, does it even make sense to regulate it the way we regulate other kinds of securities? And so we we need to be thinking about making adjustments. Now, I've taken a bit of a different approach than some of my colleagues where I really do think you need to think about that token on its own as a separate thing. Even if a token was sold as part of a securities offering, I don't think that transforms the token into a security. And and I, I think we haven't done the hard work here at the SEC, and some lawyers have been suggesting maybe that we we think about things a little bit more rigor- rigorously here because it is leaving the crypto world in this state of uncertainty about how to even move forward. Um, we haven't even gotten to, to NFTs and there are lots of other types of things that we we really need to sit down and think, okay, at what point do the securities laws apply? And if they do apply, what adjustments do we need to make to make sure that people can continue using these things without it, you know, the, the legal the legal structure being placed on top of some of these activities could actually squelch them entirely. And that doesn't make sense. So mm-hmm. let's figure out how to deal with that. Yeah, I'd love to actually explore that uh, a little bit more because there's this self-terminating nature of if you uh, what happens if you apply existing securities frameworks towards crypto assets, crypto network assets, like our crypto networks, um, like and these protocols that are built on top of other protocols are all designed to be community owned and and totally decentralized. Um, yet there's this this chicken and an egg problem that all of these tokens eventually start in some inception point. They start in this very centralized way, but they are designed to be as decentralized and diffuse and community bottom up owned as possible. Yet applying securities laws framework actually prevents them from achieving that state. So there's this like weird self-terminating relationship where like, okay, yeah, they kind of start off in a centralized way, but if you apply securities laws as they exist today, they actually never get to the point of them being in their maximally uh, manifested state, which is not as a security. So because you are defining it as a security, you actually rob these opportunity, these tokens of these opportunities to actually achieve the state that it would be if it was actually decentralized. And I think that's perhaps what you were alluding to with more rigorous thought uh, by the SEC commissioners and, and chair, I'm wondering if there if there is this understanding or acknowledgement of this like catch twenty two of we want our things to not be securities and the, the best the worst thing that you can do is to actually create securities regulations about these things that are designed to be decentralized. Do you, do you understand the conundrum that I'm trying to express? Yeah, no, here? I do. But I think what what's going on at the SEC though is I mean there's there's fair a lot of capacity to do to do good, rigorous legal analysis. But the issue is that we are taking positions that maximize our jurisdictional reach, right? If 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 a to- if if most tokens are securities, it means that most platforms where tokens trade are going to be entities that we regulate. If most tokens are securities, it means that any broker dealer that deals with any firm that deals with uh, these tokens could end up being classified as a broker dealer. So it it's a way, I think, of of maximizing the reach of the securities laws. And if we this is why this is why I really think Congress needs to come into this conversation and say, all right, look, we agree when there's a token offering, the initial token offering It would be great to have some disclosure. Let's have the SEC write up a disclosure framework. Or we agree, you know, we think that these platforms need to have some sort of regulator. Um, Okay, maybe that's the SEC, maybe that's the CFTC, some combination of the two. And so that would then sort of free us up to do a to do a better legal analysis. But right now, this is a lot of this seems to me, at least, to be about planting jurisdictional flags by just taking these very expansive approaches to where our securities laws apply. And the other thing that I don't think Washington is very good at is sort of thinking about like, okay, no one cares whether the securities laws apply or no one outside of Washington cares. What they care about is, are we, are we making the world a better place by applying regulation or are we just making things complicated and not serving anyone's interests? And so the the ability to take a step back and think about those kinds of things is sometimes hard for a regulator with a with with you know a history a long history and 
and you know a real intense desire to protect people right this this is a very there are a lot of good motives here people want to protect people it's sometimes hard to take a step back and say wait a minute by protecting people you're actually preventing people from getting access to products and services they want and you're actually not even getting them the kind of information they would want. I mean, let's talk about what does SEC registration look like? Well, the reason that we don't really know is because it's really hard to get through a process that's just not designed for your asset class or for your type of entity. And so this isn't a good outcome, but you know, for a regulator, we're like, well, you know, we're looking at our regulatory checklist and if you don't exactly tick every box on there, then you know, we're protecting investors by telling you to leave. Esther, this is why we appreciate talking to you because there's just such um, clarity and willingness to oh, kind of engage is. on these uh, on on these issues with the community. And that's really the relationship I think a lot of people in crypto are are looking for uh, from from their regulators. And and you, you're right, we don't have clarity on some of these things. But to the point of maximizing jurisdiction. I wonder if um, the argument has made internally whether the SEC actually wants this jurisdiction or not. I know, uh, you know, Bankless, we, we, we put out things that are, you know, we think are funny sometimes, but uh, we went through a thread recently of things that we're not sure if they're securities or not. Chuck E. Cheese coin versus like, uh, you know, an ERC-20. Is it a security? What's the one-to-one -one mapping? We've got baseball collectible cards that aren't securities somehow. Um, how about a digital collectible? How about that? Um, you know, sword of uh, fire that just dropped in your video game. Is that a security? And I start thinking about all of the opportunities for like digital assets. And we start thinking from the crypto vantage point of the explosion of digital assets, which is just going to absolutely balloon, right? The way websites uh, did in the early internet, you know, you started off with 20 websites and then before you know it, you have a million. And before that you have a billion and it keeps going from there. Does the SEC actually want jurisdiction over this because it seems like a complete mess to go through the process of trying to regulate a, you know, a sword in a video game, if that's kind of the direction we're going in. I'm being a little hyperbolic, but does this make well, sense? Well, I mean, not really. I, and that's uh, the SEC. Well, look, Washington regulators typically want to expand their jurisdiction. But I, I think your, your point is a good one, which is that if we apply the analysis we've been applying with respect to crypto, we would be regulating a lot of things that we're not regulating now. And so is the answer to say, well, yeah, we want to regulate that stuff too. Or is the answer to say, wait a minute, we need to like rationalize what we're, what we're asking for here. What the SEC should be regulating is, is, is capital raising. Um, that's our mandate, right? To, to regulate activities around capital raising and where it's something else that really doesn't belong with us. And I think if we don't get it right now, what we will end up with when more of the world is digital, more of the world is digital assets, more, more things are happening in that world, then we will end up with the SEC regulating everything. Now, I will tell you that outside of crypto also, the SEC is taking extremely aggressive jurisdictional stands. And we are trying to regulate a whole host of entities that uh, are not. Congress hasn't told us to regulate, but we're looking around for as many pieces of the economy to regulate as possible. So, I, I you know, nowadays I would say, yeah, our, our goal is to regulate as much as possible. And I, I speak not, that is not my goal, but I, but I think as an institution, that's, that seems to be our goal. I think we're going to need some more commissioners then, if that's the case, better look at number six yeah. and seven if we're to go <laughs> in this direction. Well, so, so Hester, I think the crypto community that pays attention to these kind of things have come to that conclusion that gone are the, is the opportunity to interface directly with the SEC and come in and shake hands. And here are the days of that's a trap. And, uh, we all, everyone kind of understands that the SEC is interested in expanding its jur jurisdictional reach and kind of putting its original first principles mandate secondary to that, uh, which is, um, a sad state of affairs, but understanding that this is kind of the paradigm, the, the paradigm that we're stepping into, what advice do you have for our industry when we, when the whole industry does kind of understand that like the SEC is not really here to advocate for our, our capital markets or our assets? Like what, what advice do you have for us and how do we proceed on this? I mean, the SEC is never there to advocate for any particular asset sure. class. So, so don't set your sights too high. But I also think 
that we're in a bad place, right? We all acknowledge that it's kind of a dysfunctional relationship. The SEC is is you know lashing out by bringing lots of enforcement actions. Um, and again, there's a place for enforcement actions, right? I think we all know there's a lot of fraud, and and we've seen a lot of that come out. And there yes. is definitely a place for us to to bring enforcement actions. But then you know the industry is is like well looking at the situation and saying, well, it doesn't benefit us to to talk to the SEC. I still think we have to have those conversations. I'm trying to push from inside for us to have more productive conversations with the industry. Um, but I think that needs to come also from from people in the industry or p- people who use crypto and and want a better regulatory framework around it. Um, you know, maybe you don't want to come in on your own, uh, but you can come in as groups uh, in 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 groups of like minded folks and come to us with use cases. Show us what you're actually trying to do with with the technology, because I think that's a really powerful reminder that this isn't just regulating away some useless activity. It's regulating away things that actually could transform people's lives. Um, I, I think that's what a lot of people in crypto believe. And so you've got to make that case with concrete use cases. Um, and we we need to keep having these conversations because what if if people who are trying legitimately to build things within crypto just say, you know what, we're just not even going to go and talk to the regulators in D.C., then what is D.C. left with? We're left with stories of really bad things happening in crypto and enforcement action after enforcement action where, you know, the conclusion then becomes, well, this is just a lawless group of people. They're not interested in complying. And so why should we waste time with doing anything other than bringing enforcement action? Something worse will fill the void is what you're saying. I fear that's the case. And, and you know, look, I... I, I am discouraged. I mean, you know, you're telling me it's been two years since we talked. I am discouraged by that. I'm discouraged that we haven't made more progress, but I'm also optimistic that we can make progress. And I think it is really important for people to remember that even if the regulators themselves don't remember this, regulators work for the people. It doesn't, it's not the other way around. Um, and so, it, you know, ultimately, even though we're a little bit removed from direct political accountability, there is accountability to the people. And so that, you know, that's something that we can continue to work on. Uniswap is the largest on-chain marketplace for self-custody digital assets. Uniswap is, of course, a decentralized exchange, but you know this because you've been listening to Bankless. But did you know that the Uniswap web app has a shiny new fiat on-ramp? Now you can go directly from fiat in your bank to tokens in DeFi inside of Uniswap. Not only that, but Polygon, Arbitrum, and Optimism Layer 2s are supported right out of the gate. But that's just DeFi. Uniswap is also an NFT aggregator, letting you find more listings for the best prices across the NFT world. With Uniswap, you can sweep floors on multiple NFTs, and Uniswap's universal router will optimize your gas fees for you. Uniswap is making it as easy as possible to go from bank account to bankless assets across Ethereum. And we couldn't be more thankful for having them as a sponsor. So go to app.uniswap.org today to buy, sell, or swap tokens and NFTs. Arbitrum One is pioneering the world of secure Ethereum scalability and is continuing to accelerate the Web3 landscape. Hundreds of projects have already deployed on Arbitrum One, producing flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystems. With the recent addition of Arbitrum Nova, gaming and social dApps like Reddit are also now calling Arbitrum home. Both Arbitrum One and Nova leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. On Arbitrum, both builders and users will experience faster transaction speeds with significantly lower gas fees. With Arbitrum's recent migration to Arbitrum Nitro, it's also now 10 times faster than before. Visit arbitrum.io where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first dApp. With Arbitrum, experience Web3 development the way it was meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free.
The Phantom Wallet is coming to Ethereum. The number one wallet on Solana is bringing its millions of users and beloved UX to Ethereum and Polygon. If you haven't used Phantom before, you've been missing out. Phantom was one of the first wallets to pioneer Solana staking inside the wallet and will be offering similar staking features for Ethereum and Polygon. But that's just staking. Phantom is also the best home for your NFTs. Phantom has a complete set of features to optimize your NFT experience. Pin your favorites, hide your uglies, burn the spam, and also manage your NFT sale listings from inside the wallet. Phantom is of course a multi-chain wallet, but it makes chain management easy, displaying your transactions in a human readable format with automatic warnings for malicious transactions or phishing websites. Phantom has already saved over 20,000 users from getting scammed or hacked. So get on the Phantom waitlist and be one of the first to access the multi-chain beta. There's a link in the show notes, or you can go to phantom.app slash waitlist to get access in late February. Hester, we've um, noticed a number of dissents, uh, the statements that, that you've had out of uh, uh, the SEC website. And the most recent one came on March 10th, uh, five days ago, alongside of Commissioner Mark uh, Ueda. Uh, pardon me for perhaps Ueda. butchering yep. Ueda for butchering the last name. Uh, and the, uh, the last sentence of this statement is, uh, we dissent. So there, you're not alone, of course. You're not the only sole dissenter as the of the five commissioners of the, of the SEC. So there's a, at least more than one of you. And I'm wondering, like, to what degree are you actually able to sway the direction of the SEC with these dissents? There's multiple people dissenting. To what degree are is that actually effective? And how how much control do you feel like you have over the the ship of the SEC? Well, I think it's an important question, and I think a lot of people looking at the SEC have no idea how it operates, right? It's a weird entity with five people running it, but Chair Gensler sets the agenda and the staff report to him, so obviously he has more, more control. The um, but the, the, the five of us um, do, you know, we're all involved in the decision-making, whether it's about rules or enforcement actions. And it is a majority rules thing. So the two of us dissenting, that was on a, a Bitcoin exchange traded product. I know Bitcoin's not your your primary interest, but but I think the, the point that we were dissenting on there was that the SEC is applying different standards when it comes to Bitcoin exchange traded products than it does with respect to other exchange traded products. That's a similar concern that I have more broadly across crypto, which is we're just making up a new regulatory framework and applying it to crypto. And so the fact that one of my colleagues came alongside me and said, yeah, you know, I look at that and I see a distinction between the way crypto is being treated and non-crypto things are being treated. I think that's a really good development. And I have my colleagues, my other colleagues have open minds too. And, and I think Commissioner Crenshaw has expressed a real interest in meeting with people from the crypto community, for example. Um, I'm sure Commissioner Lazarga does. He's he's the newest um, commissioner. I'm sure that he does as well. And so, you know, people can change their minds. We can't give up on, on people. And then if they're three, then we've got a different ballgame here. So so I, I, I really think... Um, yeah, dissenting on its own maybe doesn't move the ball, but I think it does help. It 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 helps us to think about what the issues are and maybe what some potential solutions are. Um, and so I think it's important to have that conversation and to have it publicly, which is why I put out so many public dissents. Well, we definitely appreciate reading them anytime. Uh... Gary Gensler, Chair Gensler, comes up on the the Friday weekly roll up that Ryan and I record. We always jokingly end end the section is like, "But Gary, come on the podcast. We'll we'll talk so we can talk." I'm wondering, Hester, do you think Gary will listen to this podcast? He he's a busy man with a lot of rules to write, so I'm not sure how many podcasts he listens to. Well, uh, maybe Hester- if you style it as a rom com, he he really <laughs> likes rom coms, so maybe that's <laughs> what. <laughs> what? <laughs> wow, he's always talking about him. That's so, that's going into place. I don't think the, the the podcast has ever gone, David. But uh, uh, no, we have not. You, gone you never down know. There's always new frontiers to open. <laughs> 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 um, Hester, this is um, you, you know you're talking about. You're basically saying, "Hey, crypto industry, don't give up on regulators." Uh, and you're, you're saying to kind of regulators, "Hey, you know, we gotta we gotta engage with the community." And I just want to echo the 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 problem that we have. I think between the SEC and regulators and crypto is a problem of mutual trust. Mm -hmm. And the best way you restore that trust 
I'm a podcast maximalist maybe, but it's conversations like these. It's engagement. And so I just want to say, we appreciate you engaging with the crypto yeah. community in this way and having a conversation. And we, you know, we may not see eye to eye in everything and that's totally okay. But uh, I think that the other SEC commissioners will see a set of shared values that we have mm-hmm. in crypto that are also expressed through uh, regulators like the SEC. Um, so that was one dissent that that uh, David brought up, which is the the Bitcoin ETF dissent. Um, there's also the the Kraken staking dissent as well. And what is the kind of the core of your uh, what was the core of your dissent in the Kraken uh, staking initiative for for bankless listeners who, who probably know Kraken uh, disbanded their staking product. Uh, what was that man? Time flies. A month ago, something yeah. like this, uh, David. Probably even more. Okay. Um, but I don't know. A time does. Sorry, we've had a banking crisis between now. Yeah, and then. <laughs> February 9th was the date of your descent. So just oh, okay. over a month ago, um, and then you you kind of wrote a descent on the back of that. Can you tell us about that that descent? Um, what what was your purpose in that, and what um, were you driving towards? What was the core of your argument? Sure. Well, the the Kraken um, staking service was shut basically shut down in the United States by that enforcement action and. So the first question I ask is like, okay, if 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 we think that this was a securities offering, which, you know, depending on the facts and circumstances, one of these staking as a service services could be categorized as a as a securities offering, then let's think about what it would look like for Kraken to come in or another provider of a staking service to come in and register with us. So they, you know, they come in and they say, okay, you know, this is what we're trying to do. Um, we'd like to register it with you, the SEC. If if the SEC were actually to say, all right, we recognize that this is a bit different than anything we've looked at before. So let's figure out what kind of disclosures would someone who was a customer of uh, wanting to u- use one of these services, what would they want? What information would they want? Okay, we can figure that out. We can sit down and figure that out. But I think it's more likely that the response that someone coming in would have gotten is a very long drawn out process with probably nothing to show for it at the end. Because we haven't, you know, we just want to jam everything into the frameworks that we're used to. But why? I mean, we've in other circumstances with asset backed securities, for example, we've said, you know what, these these are a little bit of a different kind of asset. So let's design a regime that makes sense for them. We could do the same thing for a number of things, whether it's crypto lending or crypto staking or, um, you know, stable coins, if the, if, if those were given to us by Congress to regulate, whatever it might be, right? We could come up with a regulatory framework that made sense. And so I guess I was frustrated by the fact that our answer is just to say, all right, great. We've kicked this, this service out of the United States. So now we can count it as a victory for, for investors. Well, I mean, not necessarily, because some people understanding the risks and the potential rewards might decide they want access to crypto as staking, uh, to to staking as a service offerings, right? And that's really not my decision to make and say, no, you can't have access to that. And so I I just didn't count it as a win for, for investors. Plus, then it was being used, that one settlement was being used as a definitive statement around crypto staking, which every product or service has to be looked on on its own facts and circumstances. And so you can't use one settlement. And again, when people settle with the SEC, there can be a lot of reasons to settle with the SEC. It's, you know, like they can't afford to litigate or they don't want to go through the trouble of litigating or whatever. And so you don't have an airing of the issues before a neutral arbiter. Um, so you can't take a settlement and say, well, that's law now and it's 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 determinative. One of the patterns, I think, in some of these dissents is this idea of, of guidance versus enforcement. What you're just illustrating there, it, it seems like an enforcement uh, approach was taken rather than guidance. Is that kind of a common theme across many yeah, of these dissents? Yeah, it is. I mean, why not, why not do it this way? Why not identify discrete issues? take those discrete issues, put out a position paper, hey world, this is what we at the SEC think when we look at NFTs. 
we think these are markers that might indicate that an NFT is a security, fits within our, our realm. Put it out there in kind of a draft form, invite people in for a public roundtable where you've got people actually sitting, talking to each other and doing it in public so this is not developed in some back room. And then after hearing that conversation, then we could go to a proposed rulemaking or maybe you know we have other tools like exemptive orders or uh, a guidance document, an interpretive guidance document, but it would be informed by a discussion with the community that knows the technology, that knows the ins and outs of this, that can react. But instead we come out with these, you know, these these developments through enforcement actions, which then we expect everyone to adhere to, and no one had the chance to have a conversation about it. It just does, it's not even the most efficient way to do things. I mean, if if we wanted to go one by one and bring enforcement actions against everything that we think is is a token, assuming, you know, as some have said at the SEC that pretty much everything, I mean, as a security, some people have said pretty much everything is a security, we would be doing this for hundreds of years. And why would we be ahead in that situation? Why wouldn't you want to just establish rules, people could see the rules, and then if they don't abide by them, then you can bring enforcement actions. It's just a very inefficient and very not non-productive way of moving forward. And we have other options, which we've used in other circumstances. Hester, what you just described of, of people coming together to kind of you talk about what the the guidance should be. It just sounds like from from the crypto community and from from regulators. It just sounds so functional. Like yeah, it's and just why not do it? We could we could tomorrow we could come out and we could say you know what we've rethought where we are and where we're trying to go. Right. And we're gonna just do something new. Let's try something new. So I I I would love that. Like plus one to that. How do we make that happen? I I, I guess um, you've got a common sense approach to these things. I, I'm wondering about stablecoins. So there's been some uh, you know action with BUSD, and you don't have to comment on any specifics with this. But like, what is the status of of stablecoins? Uh, you brought it up earlier that maybe some some um, legislation needs to be put forward. But like in a common sense regulatory mode, how could you see that being dealt with in the United States? Well, again, we could do something similar. As I said, we could we could say here because again, not every stablecoin is 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 identical to every other stablecoin, and so we could say here are some things that we think maybe pull it within our regime. But because stablecoins is an area where Congress has at least expressed a pretty direct, uh, pretty um, you know, they were they were actively negotiating legislation for stablecoins in the last Congress. I think it really at this point makes sense for us to wait for Congress to tell us what we should do in that space. Now, with everything going on over the past week, whether whether Congress is going to turn its attention to crypto or not, or or focus more on banking, we'll see. But I still think stablecoins is an area where Congress could write some you know, it's a pretty discreet area, so they could they could figure out what they want the regulatory framework to be. Um, and so my preference would be for us at this point just to wait to hear from Congress on that. Hester, I'm I'm curious, kind of um, like your feedback to uh, the crypto industry as well. We want to be we want to do our part in engaging with regulators, and um, of of course, crypto. It does not help that crypto has in 2022 had uh, a lot of bad actors that made headlines and done a disservice uh, to what we're trying to actually build here and, and do here. I know that doesn't help our cause, certainly. I'm, I'm wondering if you could give us a, a critique or a take. What could people in crypto be doing better at this point in time? What, what are your frustrations with the industry when, when you look at it? Well, look, I mean, some of the lessons from traditional finance are certainly applicable in crypto and people need to internalize those. You need to be thinking about who your counterparties are. You need to be asking whether something seems too good to be true. You need to be looking at, you know, leverage can can put people in a worse position. You need to be asking whether statements that you're getting from centralized counterparties are actually backed up by reality or not. Um, and you need to be demanding transparency from entities, centralized entities, right? And then 
identifying bad actors and and telling the regulators about those bad actors. There's a lot that the industry can do on its own to protect itself, right? You don't need to come crying to the government always for help. And that's sort of one of my general themes is it's generally better to try to figure out solutions other than regulatory solutions. Um, even when things are really bad, sometimes a privately designed solution can be more effective. Um, but And then the other piece is, as I said earlier, telling the government about use cases is important. Um, thinking about what the questions are that need to be answered by the regulator, concrete questions, and then offering up concrete solutions to uh, how could you achieve the regulatory objectives in a way that would still allow the industry to move forward um, as, it, as it should. Um, and then I guess one pitch I'll make is that in the process of this, don't lose sight of those first principles because this is a moment for us to, to be defending some of those first principles. It is a moment for us to say, no, we don't want the government watching everything that everyone does. We don't want the government to, um, to be involved in everything that happens on chain, right? And that's okay, right? Because they're, because again, there are other protections that are available through the technology. And so let's have this moment to say, is some, are some of the approaches that we've taken so far in regulating the, the, the economy and the financial system, do they work or do they need to be rethought? So don't, um, to get a short-term gain, don't give up those first principles because they really are important. And I think the decisions that we make now will have profound implications down the road. And so we, we, we can't lose sight of that, um, even if, you know, sometimes it's tempting to say, okay, we just want a short-term success on the regulatory front. Um, you have to be thinking down the road of, of are we really going to be in a better place with this kind of regulatory framework? Uh, in in effect, Hester, I think one of those first principles that crypto, uh, the industry, the community, the crypto natives need to hold on to is this principle of decentralization. And I feel like sometimes we have not been diligent enough in piercing through when things are called decentralized. There is this decentralized theater about certain projects, about certain things going on. And I think one thing that could help you tell me though is that the crypto immune system becomes better at identifying what is actually decentralized and what is centralized and learning about that. I, I do think even though um, through these mistakes though, that this is how the market realizes uh, there are centralization attacks. So when we had like BlockFi and, and Celsius and Voyager and all of these failures, um, I think a lot of people realized the market got more intelligent on where the, the centralized attack vectors actually are and the weaknesses and failures are. And that is how a market levels up. Um, but that, I feel like, is something that we could improve on moving forward. Yeah, and think, uh, we definitely want to do our part on that. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Because if if you have stuff that's calling itself decentralized and it's actually centralized, you're playing right into the regulator's hands who are saying, this is all just a centralized yes. industry and mm -hmm. we're gonna regulate it all just the way we regulate other centralized industries. Um, so be honest because you know it sometimes does take some time to move from a centralized point to a decentralized point, but you have to be honest because people can get very badly hurt if they think something is decentralized and they're actually um, you know, three guys sitting there with, with the keys to a treasury that's growing and growing and growing and then they <laughs> run off with it. So, you know, I, I think we have to, um, you know, the, we have to be honest both as regulators, but also you, you in the industry have to be honest about that. And what I do worry about is I worry that the, the regulators really want everything to be centralized. And so we're gonna be, mm. we're gonna be sort of playing that up and pushing centralization. So I think people need to be pushing in the opposite direction of decentralization to show that we're, we truly are dealing with some something different here. Um, now there are, again, I, I think a lot of people would argue that when you have a centralized entity, it doesn't get a pass just because it calls itself crypto. So, um, right. you know, then we have to deal with the risks that arise from centralized entities. I really think that's the, what I would like the Bankless Nation to uh, lead, be left with after the end of this podcast is that uh, there's this inherent 
uh, resistance towards regulators in the crypto world. We just don't want regulators, you know, you know, get out of our industry. But then really the question that comes out of that is like, well, when you when you have that sort of just spinal reflex against regulators, then you also create an environment for the reasons to be regulated in the first place to arise. Right. And so without us self-regulating and being equipped to understand why we have securities laws and things like the SEC in the first place, without understanding that, then we will just fall victim to the same trap that will invite the regulators in in the first place. Um, I agree, yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be a black and white picture, right? We can we can I mean, look, I have my own views. I'm 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 a pretty free market. Let people make their mm -hmm. own decisions. Let them let them make mistakes and learn from those mistakes kind of person. Um, whereas some of my colleagues, for example, and a lot of the American people would, would rather have a much more active and interventionist regulatory system. And that's okay, but we need to have those conversations honestly, and then figure mm -hmm. out what is the right, you know, what's the right middle ground there um, that yeah. allows people to, to realize their own dreams and, and, and take, make their own choices for themselves and their families, but also um, prevents or protects against some of these really bad things that we've seen. Mm -hmm. Hester, we actually um, invited you back onto the podcast after both Ryan and I read your remarks at the Digital Asset uh, Conference at Duke. Uh, this was in January 20, 20th in, uh, of this year. And so I just want to read a small excerpt from towards the end of that those statements where you said, uh, last year was so brutal for crypto that some people wanted to regulate it to the dustbin of failed experiments. Rather than swiping left on crypto, however, we should remember that new technologies sometimes take a long time to find their footing. What kind of country would we have if regulators prohibited people from experimenting with technologies that other people think are stupid or meaningless or even ones that could cause harm? Our country is built on a presumption that people are best able to choose for themselves. People know their own preferences, limitations, risk tolerances, and circumstances better than the government does. Sure, sometimes people make very bad decisions on behalf of themselves or their families, but handing over the keys to government does not ensure that decisions will be good. And I think that'll be how we how I uh, leave this with the call to action for the bankless nation is that we will have good relationships with the SEC if we also regulate ourselves better than the SEC can. So the responsibility is actually on us as well to, to do the SEC's job, and then we will uh, have the best foundation uh, possible to actually interface with the SEC. That's my takeaway from uh, these statements that, uh, that you gave at the Duke speech, and I'm wondering if you had a moment to reflect on that. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that that's a great point. Like take the responsibility yourself and, and, and show that, um, you know, you are being proactive about getting rid of the bad activity within your own space. And I think that that makes a good selling point to say, you know, regulators, we really don't need you to make every decision for us because we're making some good decisions on our own. But, you know, I think we as regulators also need to be introspective and and think about where we can add value and where we can't. Um, so I hope I hope we'll do that on our side as well. And the other thing I would say is I love talking to people. So um, it, people in the industry, I always learn from those conversations. And so talk to my colleagues. Um, but I often, when I travel, let people know where I'm going to be. And I, I really do welcome the chance to to hear from you directly. Um, so just putting a plug in for that as well. You need to keep us informed. I need, I'm constantly needing to learn. And, and so I appreciate people who are willing to take the time with me. Well, well Hester, thank you for taking the time. I think um, we established the framework for, for how we could move forward. I'm just, just envisioning uh, people in the industry, maybe all the shadowy super coders get together mm -hmm. with all of the evil regulating bureaucrats. <laughs> and we actually have a conversation face to face. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be amazing? I mean, I, why not, right? Why not? And I absolutely, going into 2023, I think that's possible. We appreciate all that you are doing at the SEC to make that possible. And we'll continue to kind of fight the fight on uh, our side. And last thing I want to say is, um, please stay. We appreciate you. I know there's lots of places you could go. It's so important to have regulators in uh, government that are willing to engage in this way. And I worry a little bit about that power vacuum. Of course, I know this is not an appointment for life, but I, no, I worry but, very but, much but that we don't Ryan, have- that's the key point. Yes. I think that's a key point, which is that government is not ultimately, I mean, we need to have institutions that 
are strong institutions that it won't matter who's sitting in my seat or who's sitting in the next seat. And that means institutions have to respect the rule of law, due process, and 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 the the need for people to be able to live free lives. And so it it won't matter whether I'm sitting here or someone else is sitting here. That should be totally irrelevant. And so that is the the world I'm trying to get to is where where we have these and and I think that's true of these institutions. I mean, we've got great people who who want to come in and serve and so we it, it won't matter if I'm here or not. That's that's um the key is to just get that those institutions working for the people. And I think that's where we're all we're all aiming for that. That is the key. A credibly neutral SEC, a credibly neutral crypto. Uh, Commissioner Purse, thank you so much for joining us today. We, we certainly appreciate you. Thanks to both of you. It's always fun to talk to you. Bankless Have Nation. Have a good Thanks, afternoon. Uh, Bankless Nation, a couple action items for you. Uh, some dissents will include links to the show notes to some of the... Um, some of the speeches that we referenced, also the Duke speech. Got to end with this. Risen to claimers. None of this has been regulatory advice. Of course, Hester mm-hmm. said that at the beginning. Neither has it been crypto or financial advice. You could definitely lose what you put in, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. 